welcome to the podcast, Casey. It's so nice to have you with us. Um, for those of you who don't know Casey Wilson, she is a naturopath and nutritionist. Um, over 15 years experience working with women to help them feel balanced and nourished heading into and throughout motherhood. So pregnancy, preconception, babies, all of that kind of thing. Please tell us about your journey. Yeah, well, I am a mum of two, very cheeky girls, and a wife to Tom. And actually, I was just, we were just talking about it before. We've recently moved to a farm, so I'm also going to have farmer as my title soon. <laughs> but as a naturopath, I have been supporting patients over 15 years. And this all began really for me, this passion of hormone health and gut health, because I went through my own journey in my late teens with chronic candida overgrowth and adrenal fatigue. I was a big part girl and it caught up with me basically so that sort of I went through my own journey with that and as I came out as a naturopath that was really what I attracted a lot of in clinic and I got some really good results but it was as I was helping these women um, with getting great results with their hormone health and they progressed through life of course a lot of them then wanted to bring babies into their world so they asked me to guide them through that and so I began their support as you know optimizing their their fertility health supported them through pregnancy and continued through baby and mum life so that's really it allowed me to really gain some great experience in that field and it just opened my eyes up to how effective preconception care can be to really support the the growth and development of a healthy bubba. So that was like that became my specialty and, of course, as I went through it myself, I embarked on that journey and um, had my two girls, then it just really solidified the importance of all of that and my passion for helping women and, and couples, you know, heading into and throughout their motherhood and parenthood journeys yeah so that's where it began for me sorry I noticed on your on your website that you've been through a few struggles with your own fertility and um, pregnancy nausea and all sorts of so sometimes I find it's the people that have been through well I always find the people that have been through the struggles and come out the other side are the most effective in helping others Um, Mm -hmm. how have you found your experience to help our, our biggest challenge with uh, fertility journey it, it you know in comparison to many other couples it's really not huge but um, for us we had a miscarriage the first time I conceived and um, you know I wasn't happy with just the you know it happens approach to to it and so I dug deeper and I worked with an integrative GP and we worked out for me it was low progesterone and so why I'm so passionate now is to give couples this information so to know what to get tested before they conceive to know what to build up and to ensure that they're at healthy levels before they go into pregnancy because if I had done that and knew that I had those low progesterone levels myself and and my thyroid at the time was struggling I was giving all this support to everyone else and I didn't actually test that for myself and so working with her we were able to overcome that so I then used that knowledge as a naturopath to support my progesterone and then had my two beautiful daughters after that so yeah it did really solidify the importance of getting bloods and tests on preconception and knowing where you're at uh, before heading into that that journey because you can you know prevent these things but you know they happen for a reason so now I can help so many other women and couples exactly so we're going to talk about first about preconception um, health and nutrition what kind of things do you usually start with if you're thinking about having a baby yeah well the first thing I do is I talk to my patients about the importance so I I feel like traditionally most of the focus is spent on the mum to be and not not the the dad to be so firstly I explain the importance of both of them coming on board to help prepare themselves just to really, you know, optimise their health in this time. So that for the feather, it's about his sperm health. For the mum-to-be, it's about not just her egg health but building up her nutritional reserves because and, and helping with hormones, of course, as well. But this is a big one because when you embark on that journey of pregnancy, your baby's going to be taking from you and needing all of these things, not just through pregnancy, but if you decide to breastfeed, that continues for, you know, potentially years. And so I do see 
deficiencies crop up even years down the track after pregnancy. So it's about boosting up and, and nourishing that mum to be um, supporting her egg health, supporting her hormones, gut health, of course, as well, and and for the dad to be his sperm health. And, um, yeah, that really plays a really important role because we have to remember at the time of conception that the health, the future health of the baby to be is determined not just on, on the mum-to-be but both parents' health and genetics at that time of conception. So that's usually a big eye-opener for, for couples to know that and it's a great driver to support their, make, to make these changes that they need to make um, pre-conception. Um, and I do like to talk about it as that bucket approach too. So for the mum to be, you know, filling up her bucket at the start because through pregnancy that'll that'll get taken, her nutrients will be taken to bubs and then pregnancy as well. Um, so if you start with a full bucket, it's going to give you the best chance to get through that phase and not have those deficiencies occur as well. Um, but I do like to, you know, break down this phase of preconception into at least three to four, and I say at least highlighted, because at least three to four months to build them up. So we're looking at supporting the sperm health and the egg health in those three months. Um, but if we can have longer, then we can look at like detoxification prior to that. So a good, you know, if we can do six, 12 months before they want to actively start trying, that's amazing. And we can dig deeper into detoxing before we do the rebuild stage. Um, so yeah, I feel like that's, that's important to, to know if you, yeah, you could put that time aside beforehand. That makes me think of a question that I get asked a lot. Um, mums often ask if they're pregnant, is it okay to do a healing diet because they're worried about detoxing, you know, into the baby and same yeah. with breastfeeding. So yeah. like you're saying, it's so important to work on that beforehand. What would you say to that? Yeah, definitely. It's not a time pregnancy and just before, like when you're thinking about conceiving, it's not a time to be detoxing. Um, you know, sometimes you don't have the option. And there's beautiful miracles that happen that, you know, weren't planned. Um, and, you know, we've got to let that go. And if it, we, it wasn't in our control, but if you are actively trying to detox and you're trying to have a baby or currently pregnant, it's not something that I would recommend. Um, there's ways that you can gently you know, encourage your liver health through foods and, you know, things like using cruciferous vegetables for your liver health or apple cider vinegar and, you know, just gentle ways like that that you can, of course, but I wouldn't be actively doing like a heavy metal detox or a um, parasite cleanse or something like that during pregnancy, no. And even with something like GAPS, um, the recommendation is generally keep it to full GAPS, keep it pretty wide and gentle, not the intro GAPS, right? Yeah, I just chatted to Elise uh, the other day on this too and um, she said some cases like if they were, you know, if they were already on such a restricted diet because they were having such extreme, you know, health challenges, then there may be a need for it. But, you know, most cases, yeah, full gaps and then extra carbs on top of that, yeah. Ah, extra carbs. Yeah, it's true. I remember being very um, starving for carbs <laughs> when I was pregnant. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> well, it's more so I, I actually say preconception, we need to be really in tune with our ovulation. Mm -hmm. So some women do actually need to, like the, they've, they need to be in tune with whether they're ovulating, if they're on full gaps, for instance, and they perhaps aren't ovulating regularly, maybe they do need to up their carbs a little bit to, you know, help their body prepare for pregnancy and bring that ovulation more regularly um, but some women in if they have say PCOS for example and insulin resistance they need to come back on the carbs so it's very individual uh, with the approach but in terms of pregnancy it's definitely not a time to be you know dieting and restricting just yeah. make sure firstly if you're not feeling too nauseous to make sure it's nutritious like foods that you're having so when I say carbs you know sweet potato or pumpkin rather than just you know white bread of course there's difference between carbs and carbs but um yeah it's not a time to be restricting at all your body needs that for a reason um often you know foods like dairy are craved when they don't have dairy before because bubs needs more calcium and it's it's a phase where we actually can um, absorb dairy and um, absorb the calcium better during pregnancy from those foods because you need it yeah. mm. 
So what kind of diet would you recommend during like preconception? Yeah. And then moving into the pregnancy. Definitely like a, a GAPS type approach is is really a great foundation. So through my I've got a preconception guide path to conscious conception where I step them through like a detox phase and that's very similar to GAPS mm -hmm. really sort of taking out um, you know the sugars the grains just helping their, their gut um, helping them set up for good gut health and then from there it's about you know increasing a little bit more in with like sweet potato and some some more tubers and things like that to to help prepare them for pregnancy um, but that's a great foundation um, but I do also help make sure that we're bringing in detoxifying types of foods like broccoli and cauliflower and kale and um, cabbage and sauerkraut all of those things the detoxy uh, detox savvy herbs like coriander and parsley so doing things like pesto is a fantastic because you know coriander is a really great detoxer um, this is in the detox phase too, not just straight before, but that can help to pull out heavy metals. So um, don't underestimate the power of foods. Anti-inflammatory spices, your ginger and um, turmeric are fantastic wherever you can get that in. Um, rosemary is a great herb as well. So I've got this simple recipe just for roast broccoli added onto that, some beautiful rosemary, and that's just an awesome way to help your liver and your hormones as well. Um, fermented foods, of course, and bone broth, you know all about that for gut healing and um, helping to detox through the gut. So that kind of like I, I try to take that food approach but then we could add things in like some chlorella um it, this is in more like the six month before preconception phase um, broccoli sprout powder things like this that we can ramp up that detoxing yeah in that preconception phase um, but also of course it's not just about diet it's about the lifestyle so I always you know teach well really coach um, patients and readers about the importance of low-tox living so I don't know if I need to go into that um, he go probably ahead, already dealt in, but just things like you might not think about it, seeing the dentist like a good six, three, six months out, because if you have to have work done, you don't want to be doing that through pregnancy or just before conceiving. So it's little things like that, of course, you know, filtering your water, um, you know, going low tox with all your products. They're all really important things to do, but also look at electromagnetic radiation. Um, I teach patients about, you know, having the radiation blankets on their lap because that radiation when you're on your phone, it's it's directly going into that area of the reproductive organs. So um, having some things in place that you can help to, you know, to mitigate the effects of, of that kind of stress as well. So it's not just about diet, it's about lifestyle. For those who are not really up on the EMF side of things, can you explain why, what, what EMFs are and what they can do to the body? Yeah, well, I'm certainly no um, building biologist. You, you need to get one of those on your show. I've but... had one on just recently. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, electromagnetic radiation or frequency. So they have shown through studies. So there is a study that shows through men putting um, their phone in their pocket, does it impacts that radiation can impact the sperm health. So, um, yeah, it's about the distance, like keeping our distance. We're never going to be able to in our day and age completely be free from electromagnetic radiation but it's things that like your phones um if we can have distance from them or turning them onto airplane mode or mobile um, data off when we don't need that on um about having the, the barrier blankets things like this so we're protecting those vulnerable areas um, the good thing about sperm health though is that three months three three months time you turn that over so by just making a change in like now three months time that's going to really benefit the fella's sperm health so it, yeah it is a really good driver to make these changes um but yeah hopefully that kind of explains it's it, it's the radiation component it's not great for for any of our health but particularly vulnerable areas like reproductive health I have another question about that but i'll save it because um i want to just talk a little bit more about the um yeah, the preconception care. So what about things like um, cod liver oil and um, organ meats and that kind of thing? Do you recommend those? Yeah, so 
if we're looking at like some top nutrients that I'd recommend, of course, you know, we're looking at mama to be here, we need folate rich foods. I know there's a lot of information about folate reducing the risk of neural tube defects, but it's actually really important for the whole phase of, um, you know, fertility. So uh, we want it to be in your diet for healthy egg development, ovulation and fetal growth as well. And it also continues to support that child's health through healthy DNA um, production and replication and um, their growth throughout their childhood. And we do know that folate deficiency along with B12 and um, B6 have been linked to miscarriage as well. So we want the folate there, but I say folate, not folic acid, um, because first we want folate through foods, of course. Green leafy vegetables we know are rich in um, folate, but also this is the time to grab out the liver. The liver is, has got it all in there. And as you know, like it's a powerhouse of vitamin A as well. And that that brings me to the next one. We need to be having vitamin A preconception. It's hugely important. I'll refer to my notes here because I really want to make sure that this, this um, you know, comes home for a lot of people because it's often forgotten about. But if you bring up vitamin A for pregnancy particularly, women will say, well, we need to be careful of like too much vitamin A. And that's really the only thing that we associate with vitamin A um, conventionally. So I want to turn that on its head because we absolutely need vitamin A for reproductive health. So the reason for preconception, it's a critical fat soluble antioxidant that plays a role in your reproductive health. And that also, if we're looking at that um, study that was done, it's a questionable study um, referring to 10,000 IUs as the upper limit for vitamin A during pregnancy. It is actually questionable and debatable, but even if it was, um, if we do go by that study, 10,000 IU is a lot. Um, so it's about 1,000 IU in a good quality cod liver oil um, serving so it does vary between brands but you know it's it's still a huge amount but the reasons why you want vitamin a in your diet preconception firstly it plays a really protective role for sperm health and like it it helps to protect the sperm protective mucus so sperm need this sperm protective mucus to move along and allow conception to happen so that's very important of course um crucial healthy reproduction embryonic and fetal development Vitamin A plays a role in that. Um, sufficient levels of preconception can reduce the risk of miscarriage. And this can be because the importance of vitamin A for the thyroid gland. So the thyroid is actually um, stores more vitamin A than any other organ. So it's hugely important vitamin A for thyroid, which we need for conception to take place. And it does reduce the risk of miscarriage having a healthy thyroid. And what happens here is the first half of your pregnancy, um, Bubs actually takes your thyroid hormone and the second half, Bubs takes your iodine to make their own thyroid hormone. So the whole pregnancy, you need iodine, um, but you need that thyroid to be working well. So um, iodine is another one I'll talk about in a second. But once pregnant, the vitamin A plays a role in the development of eyes and vision for bulbs, uh, but also helps to prevent uh, with the skeletal development, of course, as well, and nervous system development, um, prevents the risk of deafness, which is an interesting one, and internal organ displacement and birth defects. So with that study that I was referring to talks about birth defects with having too much vitamin A, but it's actually the opposite. So cleft palate is one of them. We need enough vitamin A to prevent that. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to food sources, there's basically retinol, which is true vitamin A sources. So these are our animal sources of vitamin A, and they are used immediately by the body. So you can use them straight away. There's also beta carotene or pro-vitamin A sources, but they need to be converted first for your body to use. And so um, there's a few things that could impact that from happening, like digestive health, thyroid health, um, reduced fat intake in the diet that can impact your ability to use those foods. So I do always recommend that we have some kind of retinol source in your diet preconception. 800 micrograms is a recommended amount at, at pregnancy. Um, so, oh, that's micrograms too. So there's a conversion that needs to be made between IU and, and micrograms. But, um, yeah, you do need that retinol source, I, I feel. So things like, you know, liver, cheese, butter, trout, caviar are the main ones. So, yeah. so 
<laughs> yeah, well, delicious. Absolutely. Some people say, well, I don't get those in my diet. So that's when I recommend, well, I recommend it anyway, the cod liver oil. Mm -hmm. It's just a great way of getting in the vitamin A and the DHA, which is another crucial nutrient for Bob's um, brain development and eye development. Through rate, sorry, of the cod liver oil. I guess it depends on the brand, but. How much did you say? Yeah. Yeah, around a teaspoon. If you're taking the liquid capsules, about three three capsules. Um, so there is that will supply the DHA and the vitamin A. Um, but if you want to boost up the DHA, you can take an additional fish oil on top of that, or just look at your food sources of DHA just to boost it up to the really high levels of of that for bright baby's brain. Um, but I do like oil because the no, no, that's all right. I, I love the cod liver oil just because it's a food form mm. of your DHA, of your vitamin A, of your vitamin D as well. And, you know, nature's provided, so let's use it. Yeah, yeah it's all in that perfect package. Um, some people get their DHA levels checked, don't they? There is a test that you can do. I, I don't Some um, midwives are offering it now. I think there's yeah. some studies with hospitals, but I don't feel like you need to get it done as long as you're taking one yeah if you are really hesitant for some reason of taking one then um then get it checked to make sure you know your levels but the levels will also change throughout pregnancy because it's particularly the third trimester when bubs is really drawing your dha for their eye development and breastfeeding as well so if you've had it checked at the start it's going to be different to, to the end of your trimesters yeah. anyway it's like any yeah. test it's just a moment in time isn't it Exactly. That's right. So, you know, you, you're always needing to be working on your health. It's not just like, I've done all the work now. I can sit back and relax. I'm good now. <laughs> um, um, and, and that's what I love about the food sources as you bring them into your diet, that all these foods that you're saying, they're really things that you would take preconception during pregnancy and during breastfeeding, right? Yeah, so this is, I'm just really chatting about preconception now, but there's absolutely a crossover between, you know, continuing them through pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, I'll mention a couple others. So vitamin D, you know, that's hugely important preconception that, that has a, a massive support for your hormone health in general, your immune health, um, reducing inflammation. So it has been shown to improve the incidence of like even IVF outcomes, um, helps to stimulate AMH, AMH, sorry. So if that's low, um, you know, there's lots of, lots of reasons for getting your vitamin D checked. I would get that checked and then knowing where you're at with that so you can boost that preconception because if you go into pregnancy with vitamin D low, bubs will also have low vitamin D. So you do want to really, um, you know, promote the, the levels of that. So of course, sun on skin is the best way of getting your vitamin D in. Um, and then once you're pregnant, those, those benefits really continue for baby for their immune health and um, their you know, mental health outcomes as well. And their you know, brain health. So, you know, vitamin D is huge. But I will also mention preconception. I would highly recommend having your urinary iodine levels checked. So this is something like when we talk about tests, these are things that I would recommend because iodine, as I mentioned before, is hugely important for your thyroid health. And if you, you know, go into um, pregnancy and you've got low iodine levels, then your thyroid's going to struggle. And as I mentioned, your thyroid hormone needs to go to baby. And so if your levels drop, then that can potentially contribute to miscarriage. Mm -hmm. um, but it also, you know, you want your iodine levels for their IQ development as well. So it's it's hugely important. If you know where you're at, often the case is in Australia, uh, if soils are deficient, we need a supplement. So that's one that I'd say across the board, a supplement unless you've got um, autoimmunity of the thyroid and that's where you need to be careful of iodine um, supplementation and that's another reason why I say, well, let's check. So I just had a patient the other day where she has autoimmunity of her thyroid. Usually she's wanting to, to conceive and so we're supporting her through that, but we did her iodine test and it was actually through the roof. So she does not need iodine, but that's a very rare case. So mm -hmm. most of the time we do need it just to, to really go into pregnancy and support things like thyroid and IQ for bumps. So with iodine, you'd usually say best to talk to a practitioner to get that sorted out, right? Get the test done. You can actually get your urinary iodine through a GP. 
and, and for the supplementation for the supplement absolutely yeah so once you've got your levels see a practitioner that that knows you know is in this field and knows what that level means in terms of what how much supplementation you need but you can always start with bringing seaweeds into your diet that's not going to be harmful you can get seaweed supplements um, you can get seaweed that's uh, salt that's had seaweed added to it like the changing habits one you can get sauerkraut that's got seaweed added to it so that's where i'd start um, but definitely looking at seeing your gp to get that checked um, if you want it covered under medicare you can get it through naturopaths as well but you do need to pay it. it's about a little bit over a hundred dollars for urinary iodine but it's very important to get that one checked um yeah so that's just a few snippets of things preconception um going into pregnancy things do you know shift a little bit with um protein requirements so protein you'd be looking at you know 85 grams up until about 30 weeks and then you really want to ramp it up to 100 grams so that's something that you can straight away look at um, per you know, day per day so it's quite a bit at the end because there's such rapid growth with baby and um, so just to put that into perspective like an egg for example is six grams of protein so it's oh, wow. quite a bit <laughs> to have it day yeah so you know smoothies with collagen and you know you can ramp it up but you do actually need quite a bit at the end and really um, the the animal sources of protein would be the best option because otherwise they, you'd be really struggling wouldn't you to get exactly enough. yeah that's when nutrient dense foods you know that's a perfect example of why yeah animal products really serve us yeah mm. can i just I continue ask about liver because I know a lot of people yeah. listening who are going, I just can't eat liver, it's disgusting. Can you give some tips about ways to get it in if you don't want to cook it or, you know? Yeah, well, like literally just before this podcast, I chopped some up and froze it in little cubes. So um, you can like tiny little amount and you can then put it into a smoothie or you can grate it into a bolognese or a slow cooked meal like you don't even taste it that way um, or you can do the next step and get it encapsulated so there's quite a few brands on the market now that do um, freeze-dried um, organic liver beef liver so you can have that otherwise um, and so that together with cod liver oil amazing sources of iron oh, the vitamin a of course but then the liver is also an amazing source of iron um, and b12 and zinc and all these other things as well so um, of course the copper so there is a lot of information about iron out there i probably won't go into that today but um, i would say if, if you're being told to supplement iron first come back to the basics and and get some liver in because the liver has got the vitamin A and it's got the copper that you need to utilise that iron and use in your body. So okay. that's something I'd say do that first. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, yeah, what do you think of iron transfusions? Because you hear that, oh, you're in your pregnancy, your iron's low, you're going to have to have a transfusion. But I've heard some things that are not so good about that. It's a huge dose. Like iron is a toxic Met, like mineral so we need to be careful of it the, the studies are showing lower doses like around 25 24 milligrams of iron a day is okay in terms of supplements it's better absorbed that way um, if you're going to do anything higher than that you need to do every second day because there's this substance called hepcidin which kind of comes in and controls the iron absorption. And so if you've done anything higher than that every day, your body's not going to really absorb it anyway. Um, so it's worth yeah, it's working with that practitioner again that understands that and having the cofactors there as well. So not just about iron, it's about copper and vitamin A and um, B12 and all those other things that you need, magnesium, to help you use that iron properly. So if you're getting... Best to have it in food sources. <laughs> Exactly. That's right. Start with your foods. And, you know, if you're getting things like green poos because you're taking iron, that's it's going through. You're not absorbing it properly. So, yeah, there's there's a lot on the market that you're probably just going to be causing constipation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I had no idea about all this stuff back in the, the back in the day when I was having my babies. And I remember all the issues with the taking the iron and then getting constipated. And it's it's not much fun. My niece recently um, had a baby and she's very up on, you know, the health and the diet. And she's she follows basically a Western A price guidelines mm -hmm. for diet. And she was told her iron was low and she had to have an infusion. And she was like, mm. I'm going to try the natural method. So she just really got into the liver and egg yolks and 
all the cod liver oil and just really focused on she had raw milk she did all the fermenting and she had the most beautiful healthy baby beautiful birth um you just like her baby is like I don't think I've ever seen such a chilled happy settled (laughs) growing so well baby and it's just such a great um, example of how the food makes a massive difference and she's got so much energy she's got two other kids she's just like yeah it's just really wonderful to see absolutely and something to um, understand there too is the reference ranges are different so what they are saying when you're saying when they're saying you're too low we need an iron infusion naturopaths have different reference ranges for pregnancy and and where realistically you should be looking at the studies around the world so for example the third trimester they'll want you at 30 or more with your ferritin whereas you know if you're down to 15 and above that's fine like 20 to 30 is a is like average around the world um so there's also other things to understand like they're low it may not be that low um Mm -hmm. as well yeah and obviously um i'm not suggesting go against you health practice mm-hmm. advice but she did take other advice and I would recommend seeing a naturopath or someone who knows how to use food because food is such a powerful medis- medicine yeah yeah well it naturally has those cofactors there like mm. it's not a synthetic form of something that yeah your, your body will know how to use it and that's that's what my food's always best mm. yes so um, um, yeah, go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> I was just going to say that iodine, um, yeah, so pregnancy, the iodine levels, as I was saying before, that is truly important as well. So that's why you really do want to be on, unless you have the, the thyroid anti autoimmunity, you really do want to be on that supplement when you conceive because it's in really early weeks that you, your body will need to be using that straight away. So just a reminder to really look at iodine as one of the supplements that you do do consider. Um, But calcium requirements also go up during pregnancy. So especially the second and third trimesters, of course, as baby's, you know, skeletal system is developing. Um, So you also need to be mindful of getting a thousand milligrams a day in of calcium. And this is where I'd say if you are following a plant-based diet that you need to be reaching for things like sardines. Oh, sorry, if you're plant-based, you're not going to be having sardines. But this is just another reason to maybe consider having some foods that yeah, yeah. So dairy, of course, if you're, you know, you're having dairy, that's the best source of calcium. We can't ignore that. Um, sardines are fantastic because the little bones have got the calcium in there. Things like tahini, yes, the sesame have got calcium in there, but you need a huge amount of them to get that 1,000 milligrams in a day. So a lot of mums do find that in pregnancy they digest dairy better and it's nature's way of like you know allowing you to absorb more of that calcium so you know don't don't shy away from dairy if you're getting good quality and of course fermented if you can as well um, for that calcium Um, just with calcium a good point is if you are taking iron supplements or taking the liver to enhance your liver your um, the liver to enhance your iron levels take it away from any dairy or any really high calcium rich foods because the two compete with each other so that is something that I see a lot of mums doing they'll have maybe some yogurt in the morning with an iron supplement or liver but the two are going to compete so have the the yogurt at night maybe for a snack before bed and have all of your iron rich foods particularly in the morning before 10 a.m and that's a really good way of absorbing iron and if you are having supplements it's before 10 a.m yeah interesting Mm -hmm. Um, If you're not getting enough calcium when you're pregnant, um, is that, can that affect your child's teeth? Yeah, that, but it's also about those fat soluble vitamins as well. So vitamin D, E, A, they're crucial for that and K of course as well. So the fermented foods and the the fermented dairy, particularly um, the butter, the liver, or cod liver oil, all of those things are going to really help, um, yeah, with the teeth development. Yeah, so Western, uh, sorry, yeah, Western Aid Price, of course, but Dr. Stephen Lynn is also a really mm, great I one. I love to- following Dr. Uh, Stephen Lynn. Yeah. So good. Yeah, so it's not just calcium. There's other um, things that you need to couple that with, but mm. certainly another reason to get into those fat-soluble vitamin-rich foods. Yeah. 
Um, glycine and choline are two that I did want to mention as well. So pregnancy is a time where those your needs for those amino acids, the, the glycine amino acid will go up and that helps with baby's brain, um, DNA, their skeletal um so their skeletal development teeth of course as well with the glycine so the best way of getting that in is your slow cooking so all of the things that joe is amazing at doing um that and that also helps to um, promote healthy skin so as your skin stretches during pregnancy glycine is amazing for that connective tissue as well um, and of course going into birth if you know there's any tearing that's going to help with the healing so collagen rich foods they're all high in glycine as well and um, they're going to help that you know boosting them up pre pre-birth is really going to going to help with the the healing um, but choline is really critical for not just um their brain health but reducing the risk of neural tube defects as well so that's something that goes up with the needs for that in pregnancy are quite high so about 440 milligrams a day and they go up to 550 during um breastfeeding so wow. the needs just and just to put it into perspective um the best source of choline is eggs and one egg yolk is 115 milligrams of choline. So you do need quite a bit of this, like of the food. Anyway. So it's, it takes a bit to get that. Uh, so this is also another one that I'd say most of the time you do need a supplement for, um, for boosting up those levels of choline. But it's actually, it's so important. And I, I refer to a um, research that shows that increased maternal intake of choline improves the information processing speed of a baby. It showed this at four, seven, 10, and 13 months of age. So that's just a, a um, study I linked to in one of my um, books, but choline really helps that process. So it is it is a good one that I'd say, you know, up, up your eggs and um, consider a supplement there. Yeah, maybe you could give us the link to that study later to put in the notes, that'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I just shake my head when I hear the things on social media about don't eat eggs. I'm like, this, this is like a superfood. <laughs> so, yeah. It's that risk to benefit rate, like looking at the benefits of having the eggs, even if they are running, like personally, I had runny eggs. Um, you know, it's just so nutritious for you to to leave them out just for that tiny, you know, chance of you having a bad one, then that's, yeah. It's something that you need to think about yourselves. Like I'm not going to go tell everyone to have a heap of raw eggs, but um, certainly eggs are nutritious. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there are a few things there that I um, would suggest. And as I said, with that protein, that's the big one for upping upping the level of, of what you're having through the day, particularly the, the last trimester is when baby's going to be growing rapidly. And that's also when that DH, DHA requirement goes up for their eye. Um, their eye development as well yeah what about cravings you know when um, someone's usually on a certain diet and then they go into pregnancy and they want stuff that they never usually have like you mentioned dairy um, I had a friend who was um, I think she was vegan vegan or vegetarian and she craved meat during pregnancy probably because of the protein um, like how do you know if your cravings are something you really really need to get or is it yeah, sometimes there's weird ones, I know. But. Well, a lot of the time it is your body telling you something. So PCA is um, what you call the funny symptoms of like eating chalk and yeah. dirt, things like that when you're low in iron. So oh. I, if it's a healthy food you're craving, absolutely listen to your body. Like it is clever at telling you what you need, especially in pregnancy. But if it's for, say, like, you know, ice cream and sugary foods, then <laughs> you find a, find the most healthy option that you can to have those foods um yeah I, I think there's a there is a fine line but um mm. yeah definitely in a circumstance like that if they're vegan and craving meat or craving dairy then it's their body saying we need something yeah what about yeah. if you're craving chocolate well potentially magnesium yeah or chromium um so yeah, there's certain things like magnesium, magnesium and B6 can help with um, chocolate cra or sugar cravings in general. So, you know, maybe they are deficient in magnesium. Doing it, some salt bath at night might help, or having a magnesium spray or supplement. Um, but yeah, a little bit of chocolate. I think a good quality chocolate is is fine. It's just about the 
reaching for. Yeah. Okay, so is that sort of the main dietary recommendations for pregnancy? Should we go into breastfeeding maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah let's go into that. So um, I guess the biggest thing here is honouring your body. I see too many women go into, you know, motherhood unprepared and they're thrown into this midst of broken sleep and learning to be to look after their baby and the last thing they were thinking about was what they should be eating or or how they should be resting um so i'd say do if you you haven't been there yet and you're pregnant now or thinking about having a baby do your research and and get empowered before birth so that you're fully prepared and you know what to do if something comes up but also um, how to look after yourself so the biggest ones for helping your breast milk um, production is resting and warmth post-birth so we naturally what's called vata dominant so cold and windy post-birth so we need to be keeping warm particularly feet and head and like warm clothes we need to be resting our eyes from screens this can go a long way to then help with your milk coming in so honoring your body resting post-birth and asking for help that's huge Um, but of course it is um, about what you're having as well within your body so three liters plus water a day is really good to help with um, hydrating and that can include teas of course as well um, to help with breast milk production so you can bring in some fennel tea or fenugreek tea or a mix of that and ginger they're beautiful for helping milk production Um, you need to understand that you need more calories um, during breastfeeding so around 500 more calories but it's not just about like we said at the start just having more carbs or or more food in general it's about the quality if you can get the quality in nutrient dense and more calories through that that's going to really support breast milk production Um, once again protein is important it does come down a bit from the third trimester but to around 80 grams which is still a good amount um, per day and that's helping your body give you the building blocks to be able to make this milk as well um so th- going for quality of course like organic and grass-fed meats and um you know free range if or if you can get organic um poultry eggs like we talked about and there's a difference between eggs that are roaming on uh, like from chooks that are roaming on pasture instead of caged hens I'm, I'm sure your listeners know all about that by now um seeds nuts of course all of those things as well but the animal products you can't beat those for you know protein sources as i touched on before your baby does leach your dha during third trimester and breastfeeding so making sure that you're building those levels up you you may still be having your cod liver oil i would highly recommend that but looking at oily fish through your foods as well and that's going to help to prevent a mushy baby brain because that can be contributed from that low DHA, um, but it's also those good healthy fats that are going to help with your brain health in general, your blood sugar and your energy levels as well, which is what a new mum needs. Um, so getting that protein and getting the good fats alongside it really helps and, and fish is a fantastic way, way to supply both of those. Um, the choline we talked about, that goes up from pregnancy, so it was already at a high amount that you needed, but it goes up again. Um, so those eggs, eggs are fantastic, unless, of course, your baby is upset from the eggs then that's something that you'll need to navigate but um, once again you may need a supplement for the choline because of that and when I say so I talk about carbs you know you may need more of them in general but just going for those healthier ones so as I mentioned at the start choose your pumpkin over your white bread or pasta and you know you you know how to navigate that one but it's just yeah choosing wisely And looking at super nutrition, so liver, once again, it's the best way to boost these nutrients. You'll probably be, you know, lower in your iron. It's it's very normal and you're meant to be lower in your iron because the baby's taken that. And so you can boost that up through the liver um, post-birth as well. And, yeah, just know that this is a time when you really do need to be reaching for those nutritious foods to top yourself up again. As I talked about at the start, that bucket's coming down and down because baby's taking from you. And if you're trying to produce this milk as well, then that's, you know, baby's taking that way and we need to top you, top you back up again. So you may need supplements and you may need to see a naturopath just to really support yourself through that too. But start with the foods and just be honest with yourself. Do you need to slow down? Do you need to take more naps? Do you need to ask for help? Do you need to see someone to get these 
you know, guidance on supplementation, just take that time to nurture yourself because that is powerful when it comes to helping you to produce milk for your baby. Yeah, I think um, breastfeeding and having a new baby is not the time to be Miss Independent. <laughs> Ask for help. <laughs> I just, I remember what I was like. Um, yeah, I always, I guess I always asked my mum for help, but that was, but I was pretty independent. And I, I see that in different family members, you know, and they're, they're stressed with the new baby and they've got a lot on their plate, but they don't ask, but you know, also as a family member, you need to be very aware that if someone in your family has just had a baby, um, bring them meals, take them some good quality eggs, you know, just do it. Don't even ask. <laughs> it's um, it's something that we've really noticed in our family that we try to all band together to provide meals for the new mamas. And really, you know, even three months in, they're still going to need a bit of help. Don't don't go. Okay, they're okay now. Baby's three yeah. months old. Absolutely. Keep help. Do you yeah. find with um, babies that are reacting to say dairy in the mother's diet? Um, is there some suggestions you would have there? Yeah, dairy is one to be careful of in the first few weeks because bubs is still not producing lactase enzymes. So often that does contribute to colicky symptoms. So when does that I, sort of the lactase well, start to? It's it's after the first few weeks. Apparently, it does start to um, be produced. But I do find a lot of the time dairy in the first six months is an issue for mums. I had trouble so, with mine. <laughs> So just be honest with yourself if you know that it's upsetting bubs. Like this is a time to kind of be eating pretty plain and and then you can work out what foods are upsetting. Um, take a journal. This this time can be really confusing because is it something you've eaten? Is it because they're teething? Is it because they're, I don't know, something else is happening? So write things down so it is easier so you know, okay, I did have that new food last night and then I had a poor sleep. Perhaps that was they're contributing factors but yeah there's a lot of foods and I I don't like to overwhelm new mums with the list of things that it could be but yeah dairy unfortunately is one of the the main culprits soy as well um and just too much of even good foods like broccoli so it can be the amount that you're having so just start small and work your way up from there and you know most mums are in tune with knowing okay my bumps is a bit upset from that so yeah write it down and, and for some people it's chocolate or yeah even or onions, onions garlic onions, yeah. yeah I had a friend who said it was um fizzy water like even just mineral water yeah, carbonated, um, yeah, so kombucha is definitely one that will upset bubs most of the time because of the ferments are quite strong initially to bring in but also because of the bubbles. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something to be mindful of is if you are used to having all of your fermented foods, just start slowly again post-birth because that could, yeah, potentially be upsetting bubs. Um, but, yeah, there's, um, I can't remember the question now, but there's certainly some things that you can reach for like, Beautiful chamomile tea can be something that's quite easy to make up for yourself um, that you can have that can help to calm both you and Bob's gut. So there's certainly lots of things that we can reach for, but just being in tune and writing things down helps. Yeah. And for meals, things like slow cooked soups yeah. and stews and casseroles yeah. and absolutely. Because you're that, saying warming. Yeah. Yeah, warming broth, soups, stews, that's all really beautiful and easy to digest as well. We have to remember that too post-birth. Um, there is, if we're looking at Ayurvedic um, side of things, they also look at warming foods, but it's more plant-based. But uh, I'd say that if you're not used to that diet, um, it's not a time to just all of a sudden post-birth have a heap of those foods like mung beans or brunians that, a cup of curry and to have post-birth I'd say try them out first um during pregnancy but you can't go wrong with a beautiful broth and and slow cooked meats on the bone and and just slowly bring the veggies in uh, initially it might just be some wilted spinach or something like that well cooked through the stew and then progressively increase like your brassicas slowly because they could yeah cause a bit of wind for bubs and what would you recommend if someone's losing their milk supply like before three months so starting to dwindle 
what's some really good ways to get that up again? Yeah, so that's where firstly I would say making sure you're getting the foundations right. So those things that we've talked about, the protein, the you know, having those supplements there as well, the choline, um, like building yourself up, that's the first thing, keeping warm, keeping rested. If you're still noticing issues, and this is sort of a bit of a checklist, is make sure that, you know, if they're not wetting two nappies a day in the first few days and then six daily from there, that is a pretty good sign that they're not getting enough. Um, you can also, of course, get them weighed and things like that. But I don't like to stress mums out early because there's often a phase where bumps, they bounce back with their weight. So I wouldn't be like worried in the first week that they've not met those measurements because often it's your, your body's like your milk doesn't come in sometimes until five days. So just be kind with yourself there but if you are noticing you know in weeks down the track that this isn't happening they're not having six plus wet nappies a day I'd firstly I'd ask your GP to test your thyroid because often it's thyroid related um, they may only need they may only be able to do TSH so if you can see a naturopath they can get the whole panel tested so you're looking at TSH T4 T3 if possible reverse T3 and thyroid antibodies and check if that's an issue because if that's the case there's certainly things that we can do as a naturopath to support your thyroid to bring back that milk supply um you know it goes by you know demand so making sure bubs is constantly like feeding from you to help um increase that demand it's supply and demand so yeah if you're trying to stretch them out for four plus hours between <laughs> between feeds then that's not going to help with the milk supply so getting them on regularly can help to bring that back as well so yeah i'd say nutritionally and from a naturopathic perspective the thyroid is a big one that um you know you want to get that one checked but there's also some galactagog foods so they're foods that help to promote breast milk um so ginger is one of those as i mentioned at the start oats um if you're you know not sure about oats or if they don't digest well with you you could try them even soaked overnight before you have them make them into a yeah. porridge um flax seeds so there i'd recommend that they're ground because if you just eat flax seeds that is going to go straight through you so ground flax seeds in the from the fridge to keep them nice and fresh then you could put them through a smoothie or you know a, a warming um porridge um, brewer's yeast is one but getting a good source of brewer's yeast is an issue and if you do react to gluten then that's out of the out of the question um fennel as i mentioned before fennel tea is fantastic but you could use fennel vegetable as well so incorporate that through your foods as well fenugreek um, too with the herbs that and uh, with the tea that's often in a lot of nursing formulas um alfalfa herbal tea as well milk thistle herbal tea um, stinging nettle, um, your fermented foods, as I said, go slowly, but they actually can help with your, your milk production too. But, um, yeah, the, the main thing I say is make sure you're resting, um, getting bubs on regularly and making sure you're nourishing yourself with those foundations first and um, getting that thyroid checked. Yeah. Good tips. Thank you. Um, and with the babies. As they're developing and you're starting to think about bringing in solids, um, you really want to be careful of their microbiome as well as what's mm. first foods. Have you got some tips there or is this getting too long? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is where this is the stuff that I love. Um, so I just firstly say that just to, to solidify the importance of this phase. So if you have a baby under three years of age, it's such a special time because in terms of gut health, that is, mm -hmm. because their gut microbiome or their, their microbiome is still developing. So up until the age of three, it's rapidly developing and at the age of three roundabouts is when it's compositionally similar to that of an adult. So that means that we've got this really opportunistic time most of the time it's in our control too that we can do these things to help support that development and so you know that starts with with helping out their microbiome and their intestinal integrity which is their, their gut health so we do need to remember things like you know our gut is home to 70 percent of our body's immune cells that gut bacteria and the the metabolites they interact with cells lining the gut wall and the underlying immune cells so 
you know, they go hand in hand. We need the health of the gut microbiome is essential for the immune system maturation in children. And so why this is important, like why do we need to support that microbiome is because we know that there's, you know, there's lots of research that I linked to in Thriving Bubba, the baby book, um, if we can support this microbiome development now in that early age, that has the power to reduce the risk of diseases later on and promote vibrant health for years to come. And we know that poor microbiome development has been linked to issues with immune, digestive, um, reproductive, uh, yeah, metabolic, sorry, inflammatory diseases as well. So just an example there, um, low bifidobacteria. So bifido is the main one we want in a baby's um, their their gut that's what we predominantly want there initially um, low levels of that bifido is linked to elevated risk of asthma and obesity later in life and it's also linked to the development of eczema and allergies as well and another study that i linked to in my baby book is um, it showed an attention and language improvements in babies with healthy levels of two of the main bifido strains as well. So there's a big connection between gut brain, gut immune system, um, metabolism, all of those things. So, yeah, what well, that's why we need to come back at to this stage and really support it. So I guess when we're looking at factors that can impact their microbiome, we know pregnancy health. So there's some transfer of bacteria through the amno amniotic fluid in pregnancy. Of course, mode of birth. So if it's a vaginal birth, bubs is going through the vaginal canal and picking up your bacteria there. Um, so it's more babies will then be more compositionally, their microbiome is compositionally similar to your gut and um, vaginal microbiome, whereas if it's a baby born C-section, it's more similar to your skin um, and oral microbiome. But that, that can be turned around. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, so also the way that they're nourished, whether that's through breast milk or formula and when they're ready for foods, that can all impact their microbiome too. So I'll, go, I'll dive into that in a second. Whether they're getting skin-to-skin -skin contact, so baby will be taking on all the bacteria in his or her environment post-birth and so we want it to be yours through skin to skin and not the hospital's bacteria if you're birthing in a hospital. So this is a big one uh, that I always mention is take your own blankets and um, towels and anything you can for bubs when you if you're birthing in the hospital so they're picking up your bacteria and not the hospitals but continuing that skin to skin is a beautiful way over time to enhance um, that bacteria um, you know them absorbing your bacteria from your skin that is um, whether they're on medications like antibiotics of course that's going to disrupt that development in those you know particularly those first three years of life and then when, whether they're on probiotics to help with the recovery but most importantly with probiotics the research is showing that it helps to prevent the reoccurring infection that often happens when you have antibiotics in the first place and we know that dose dependent um the, like the impacts of having a dose of antibiotics it's um that like if you can reduce the risk, uh, the the incidence of taking antibiotics, that's a really big one. So probiotics are really helpful. I will say though that probiotics need to be baby specific uh, because as I mentioned before, the main um, strain we need is the bifido in their gut. But also how dirty they're getting over time. Are they getting out playing in nature and getting dirty and playing with pets and other children? That's all really important. So, but what I will address is I was talking having a um I was talking at an event the other day to a group of mums and they had a lot of these like what if questions. So I'll address some of those because I know they come up often. Yeah. So the first one is what if they are born C-section or or potentially they can't breastfeed either. But firstly I'll say if they're they're born C-section, request the skin to skin. So then at least, you know, you're getting that beautiful bonding post-birth. That's going to help with remediating any stress of pot potentially that event of a C-section, um, beautiful bonding with bubs, and that helps with your breastfeeding journey as well, having that skin to skin. And these babies, as I said, they'll have that bacteria that's more similar to mum's skin and oral microbiome. But exclusively breastfeeding has shown to assist the recovery in their microbiome of C-section-born babies. So they're the, then they're closely resembling that of a vaginally-born baby by around six weeks of age. So that's really powerful if you 
you know, weren't wishing to have a C-section and you're quite down about that process, at least you know that if you can breastfeed, that can help to recover that microbiome. And breast milk, the way that this works is that breast milk has prebiotic, probiotic, immune modulating and gut motility regulating properties within it. So the the main type of um, bacteria in the baby's gut, the bifido, that breaks down the sugars, the oligosaccharide sugars in the breast milk, which feed on the bifido, and in turn that supports all other organisms to grow. So it's this beautiful cycle that occurs when the breast milk's feeding the bifido and the bifido is being breaking down the sugars. And then over time, usually by around six months, there's a much more diverse microbiome there for bubs so that's why breastfeeding is you know just one of the reasons why it's so beautifully beneficial for bubs um but the next question of course is what if they can't breastfeed what i would suggest doing is seeing a naturopath so that they can give you some baby specific probiotics there's some on the market that do have some prebiotics that might be a bit harsh initially for bubs so if you've got a really young bubba um there's ones that are better than others, Um, but also over time doing that skin to skin and letting them get dirty, that's all going to help over time reduce the risk of allergies. We know um, that occurs when they get dirty over time. So you can do all those things as well. So once again, there's always something you can do to improve their microbiome. So when you say yeah. probiotics for babies, are you talking about something the mother takes or something you put yeah, on? Yeah, both. Or... Yeah. So what I would suggest for most, across the board, for, for most breastfeeding mums, I say you take one yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if something comes up, so whether they're born via C-section or if they're bottle like formula fed or if they have colic or if there's something else like eczema happening, um, then look at a probiotic that you can give to bubba direct so it's a bit stronger that way but otherwise that breast that um probiotics will come through the breast milk so that's a starting point that i always say um but i will also address um another what if is what if they get sick and it and this is for children in general i just say that firstly if they're being recommended to have antibiotics really question the need for the for the antibiotics um but you know that there's these superfoods like sauerkraut juice that you can give to bubbers that just absolutely boost up the the good bacteria and their immune system. So there's things that we can do that are very gentle but powerful for for babies. Oh, um, so yeah, sauerkraut juice uh, around four months. I would say you could bring that in. So when you're looking at potentially bringing in solid foods, that would be the first thing to do. Um, but otherwise, yeah, yeah, I can talk about that in a second. Um, but don't be scared of kids getting sick it actually trains their immune system so you know them getting cold that that develops their immune system and trains it so it's it's a it's a beautiful process but usually what happens is if they're breastfed then there's this um you know nature's way of protecting a baby is if mum's exposed to something then um, they have this open gut babies do natural open gut and so that allows the antibodies produced from mum to get in through the milk into babies quite easily so there is a beautiful um, protection that occurs in nature naturally. But if your bubba does get sick, don't be scared. It's, you know, something that will help their immune system long-term. And there are things that we can do to help support them. Yeah, but you did mention about introducing food. So um, what I would suggest here is that, um, you know, I've got some considerations and I'll, I'll go through those because I think they're really important. Let me get my notes up. So basically... Before, when someone says, you know, they're ready for for, um, bringing in solids or they're thinking about, you know, um, starting the process, I just say look at these considerations first. So we're wanting to encourage healthy microbiome development long term and we want to also support baby's natural gut maturation. So as I just mentioned, the the babies have this natural open gut they're born with and that's so that those antibodies from mum's milk can get in into bub's bloodstream for their protection. This naturally starts to close from around six months of age, six to nine months. And so that's as, as the baby's gut and the immune system matures. And it's therefore, in my opinion, a much better way, a like better time to start to introduce food. So then, you know, it's it's closing. So there's 
a less likely chance of undigested food proteins getting into the bloodstream and causing immune reactions and um, responses and, and food intolerances and things like that. So we want to avoid that leaky gut long term and those, you know, immune reactions like, yeah, inflammation and food intolerances and immune challenges and we want to just optimize their absorption of the nutrients in general so that makes sense to me and um, that's sort of something that you can go by to really honor their their gut maturation first of course we want to optimize their nutrition reduce toxicity and support detoxification through foods and the first thing we need to really look at is that Iron stores in breast milk drop around six months of age. So firstly, we should be looking at iron-rich foods for Bubba. There's two forms. There's iron um, heme iron, which are from animal sources, and non-heme iron from plant sources. And if we're looking at heme, heme sources, they are more superior. We know that they absorb better over non-heme, but also importantly, over iron-fortified foods. So something that comes to mind is rice cereal. So rice cereal is not only low in the absorption of their iron, but it contains phytic acid. So that's that um, impacts the other the absorption of other minerals in in that food. So it's you know we need you we need zinc as well. So for example, that phytic acid will would impact the absorption of zinc from the foods, which we know is hugely important for their growth and their gut lining health, their immune system, their brain health. Um, so we're looking at foods, what foods would naturally contain iron or B and B12 and zinc, of course, meats would, slow, slow cooking and um, bringing in liver and egg yolks. These are all amazing foods for first for bubbers. Eggs, of course, contain that choline, which we've talked about a bit as the importance for their you know, brain health and cognitive function. So um, yeah, that'd be things that I'd be looking at there instead. So we're going for nutrient-dense, pure superfoods rather than those fillers. And of course, those foods will naturally contain those nutrients that help them to detoxify naturally as well. So, and they're going to easily absorb that rather than it creating inflammation in their, their gut. And of course, you know, choosing foods from scratch instead of, you know, from buying from a packet, of course, um, quality is important. So I mentioned about the eggs before, so that, you know, looking at things where, the, where it comes from, an egg that's been laid by a barn um, raised chicken is going to be completely different to that, that the chook's been running around scratching in grass and eating insects and in the sun. So they'll generally have a brighter yolk, which is more vitamin A. So, you know, we know there's more nutrients in that. Um, we want to enhance their digestion, their absorption and utilisation of foods. So we want to be looking at pur purposeful sourcing of foods. So just an example there is um, avocados that are ripe um, contain more lipase, so it's slightly squishy rather than one that's quite hard. And bananas that are brown spotted are easier for bubbers to digest because they have higher amylase enzyme content. So that's just a couple of examples there. And then, of course, um, Joe, you're, you're all about preparing these foods properly. So, you know, fermenting and soaking can help their absorption of foods. And, um, you know, it's just another reason why we don't want to rush into um, giving food, all these foods at once to bubbers and, and particularly when I'm looking at that and talking about cereals because they don't start to produce those enzymes to break down cereals until at least one year of age. So that's something to also think about when um, we're bringing in foods and, of course, their well-being. So we want to create a beautiful environment, respectful, clear, clear communication, a happy mealtime experience to you know, create these healthy long-term habits around meal times. So there's some things that I generally say first. And in terms of, um, you know, reducing the risk of allergies, we want to be breastfeeding alongside of, of bringing in the foods that's been shown to reduce the risk of allergies. And the current guidelines are saying after four months of age, just before six months of age. But as I said, um, within that, you know, looking more, more at the six months of age will help their gut um, you know, honor, honor their gut maturation. Yeah. So that's some big, big ones that I like to go through. I'm fascinated by, um, ghee being a first food in India. Have you? Mm. Yeah. Well, I assumed I haven't actually looked at, at what yeah. that list would be like, but of course. And, yeah. and so, you know, good fats being so important. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, so what do you recommend for fats for when they're mm -hmm. first 
starting solo yeah, well, having the like when you're slow cooking like giving them the fat within that um avocados would probably be the one of the biggest um fat sources initially but cod liver oil um so that's that can be given to bubs it, it is going through the milk if you're having it yourself but what i've found it with the cod liver oil is like naturally i just wanted to give it to my bubbers anyway and i've noticed that earlier you can do that then they're going to like that food mm. whereas if you wait until after perhaps you're not taking it anymore or breastfeeding they're likely not going to like cod liver oil then unfortunately so if you can start to bring these foods in earlier they don't know the difference. Like they're not being brainwashed to what's a yucky food and what's a yummy yeah. food. They're, they're just going to gobble it up. So, um, yeah, I think that's a really food. awesome food for their brain and if we can bring that in. And it, it teaches them, you know, you could take it off the spoon. So I like to do a combination. People ask whether I'm baby-led weaning or spoon feeding. I think they both have benefits. Yeah. Uh, I think the benefit of spoon feeding is you can get foods in like cod liver oil and broth. And um, that's really beautiful. Um, how I'm much, gonna... Sorry, can I just quickly ask how much you would give them? Cod liver oil. We'd start with the very first time you give it to them, I'd start with even less than a meal and work up to one meal at, by one years of age, uh, to two meals of two, meal, two meals by two years of age. Yeah. There's so much information that you've given us. Can you just quickly tell us about your book? so that those who need more information can go and find it and also your website, podcast. Yeah, amazing. You, well, you can find me firstly on Instagram at glowingmama.thrivingbubba, but if you're in any of these stages, so whether it's, you know, heading into baby mum life, whether you're pregnant at the moment or whether you have a bubba, um, if you head to glowingmama.com and that's mama, M-U-M-M-A, um, I've actually given a set up a code quirky. So if you want to... Um, jump in and get any of the products and you can get a special price on my preconception guides, path to conscious conception, my pregnancy, birth and postpartum program, path to glowing mama and my baby book thriving bubba. So that's code quirky at glowingmama.com. Oh, that's so cool. I'll put that in the notes below as well. Thank um, you. And yeah, there's so much information there that I wish I'd known when I had kids, but you know, you just start where you are and do the best you can, don't you? I, that's the big takeaway is you yep. can always do something from here. So don't look at, back at what you haven't done. Always look forward and, and what you can do from here is just, yeah, there's so many things we can do. And any age of children or even adults start bringing in those same foods you're talking about because they're always going to be, be of benefit. Which you're a massive testament to, Jo. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that the hard way. Mm. Um, yeah. So thank you so much, Casey. That was really, really helpful. And I know there's going to be a lot of mums out there or almost mums or hopeful mums. Um, very, very um, thankful for the information. Oh, thank um, you so, so much for having me. over and check, check out Casey's Instagram and website and um, have a look what she's got shared there. Thanks Thank you so much, so much, Jane. Have a great day.